this is going to be our first video lecture that we are doing and it is going to be over the chapter for metabolism. So you guys have a packet uh, for metabolism, have that with you, any notes that you want to jot down, you can do it on that packet or if you have a notebook, whatever works best for you, you guys can kind of figure that out. So any weeks that we don't meet, this is the process that we will kind of work through where I will post a video lecture for the content that we need to cover and then there will be some sort of assignment or something that you have to work through as well. So there will always be two pieces to a week where we don't meet face to face. I post it uh, as close as possible to that Monday so you have a full week to get it done and all the assignments that are associated with that um, are due Sunday evenings at 11.59 p.m. And I will remind you of this in class, but just so you kind of have the framework of how this will work when we go into the online learning portion of our class. So as I mentioned, you are going to have that metabolism PowerPoint with you. And looking at this particular PowerPoint and talking about metabolism, right now, metabolism is so skewed in people's minds because of how we commercialize it. When you talk about metabolism, people immediately think that it's all about I either am, have high metabolism and burn off calories quickly or I have a slow metabolism and I tend to hang on to calories. And while that's a part of it, it's not the whole picture. When we talk about metabolism, what we are actually looking at is all of the work that your cells do in a given day. And so a lot of times people look at cells as just building blocks that they frame out your body, give you your shape, your structure, but they don't understand that cells are actually doing work all day, every day. They're like tiny little factories that you guys have in your body. And throughout the day, as they are doing work, the energy that they consume to do that is going to ultimately lead to your metabolism. So it's a little bit different than how it's portrayed. Generally, if you're watching commercials, um, they talk about slow or fast metabolism and equate it to calorie burn, but there's so much more to it than just that. So looking at that first slide, it gives you the definition of metabolism, and then it also talks about two different types of metabolic reactions that happen within the body. You have anabolism and you have catabolism. Now, in the case of anabolism, what happens is we are going to take small individual molecules and we are going to link them together to get a larger molecule. Now, because we are taking two things that were not originally associated with each other and we are linking them together, there's going to have to be some sort of energy input that goes into that. So it takes energy to build these molecules because energy is essentially what holds them together. On the flip side, catabolism, now we're going to take these larger molecules and we need to break them apart into smaller ones. And any time that you break a bond, there is going to be that release or that surge of energy that is given off. And so we can really use this in the human body to do different things. If we are building structures, we're going to use the anabolism side. So if we're making more muscle tissue or bone tissue or things like that, we're going to take small individual pieces and link them together to get the desired structure. In the other case, catabolism, Sometimes you have stored molecules. Let's say you have stored fat in your body and you are burning more calories than you have consumed. Now we need to take those fat molecules and we need to break them down into smaller ones so that you can tap into that energy and allow that energy to then fuel your body. So two of the different functions that we have within metabolism. Now looking at anabolism, it is very easy to look at that bottom picture and get kind of swept up in it. There's a lot of letters and abbreviations and you've got all these hash marks all over the place. And what I want you to do is not focus on that as a whole, but just look at the space between the first two monosaccharides. So on the left-hand side, you have two simple sugars. Those are your monosaccharides. And if you'll notice, there is a part that is highlighted in between those. It's an oxygen molecule and two hydrogen molecules. So what do you know that involves two hydrogens and an oxygen? Well, that's a water molecule. And so what happens in order to take these individual sugars and link them together is we are going to remove that one oxygen, those two hydrogens. And by doing that, 
we now create a situation where the remaining elements that are left behind are going to want to attach to each other or link to each other. And so in that process, they go from being individual structures to now being linked together. Because we removed a water molecule in order to do that, if you take water away, you are dehydrating it. And so that's why a lot of times anabolism is known as dehydration synthesis, because in order to link those molecules together, you have to pull or draw that water out of the original structure. Once that water is removed, now the remaining structures or elements that are left behind want to interact with each other. Again, we're trying to fill those outer shells and keep those elements happy. And so the remaining elements will bind to each other and now they're linked as one unit. So we go from two small ones to one larger one. That is the process of anabolism. The next one, catabolism, is a little bit different. We're actually going to do the exact opposite. So now we have these two structures that are linked together and we don't want them to be stuck together anymore. And so we're going to add water and by adding water, the elements that are involved are going to restructure themselves and the bond that is holding those two individual pieces together is now going to be dissolved or broken because that incoming water is going to interact with those available elements and break them apart into the original two pieces. And so the addition of water to help this process along is referred to as hydrolysis. So if we're going to link them together, we need to take that water out, dehydrating it. If we want to break them apart, we add the water in, and that is known as hydrolysis. So just a quick look at how those two things work. You don't need to worry about all the other letters and all the other hashes. You just need to understand the framework of it, that it requires water either to link them or water to break them apart. Now, when we look at metabolic reactions in the body, one of the most important things that we have are structures known as enzymes. There are a lot of things in the human body that require chemical reactions, but actually happen so slow that if we didn't have a way to speed them up, we would die. And so the use of these enzymes is really going to be beneficial to make sure that they happen at a fast enough rate that we can sustain life. Now, enzymes are very specific in how they work. They have a very unique structure, and they have another piece known as a substrate that will actually have to bind with the enzyme, so they'll have to fit together in order for the chemical reaction to happen. You don't want chemical reactions to take place that you have no need for, and so that's why we see this design with our enzymes. The enzyme molecule itself is going to, like I said, have a very specific shape to it. And somewhere floating around in your body, there is a substrate that matches it. And then they will fit together. And once they have united as one piece, now whatever chemical reaction they carry out will be able to take place. Your body can regulate enzymes and substrates based on how many they release. If you don't want a chemical reaction to happen, your body simply won't release any of the substrate. And if there's no substrate to lock into the enzyme, no chemical reaction is going to happen or vice versa, it can regulate how much enzyme is available for those substrates to be able to lock into. A lot of times enzymes and substrates are referred to as a lock and key model, because if you think about your keychain, you have multiple keys, but there's only one key that's going to open your house. There's a different key that is going to open or turn on your car. And so the body is designed the very same way. To make sure that only certain chemical reactions happen, each enzyme has a specific substrate or a specific key that it is looking for that is the exact right shape to turn that enzyme on and allow it to work. Once the enzyme and the substrate have found each other, the amount of energy that is needed for that particular reaction to take place is reduced, and now that reaction will happen faster or sooner than it would have if we have to just wait on the body devices themselves. One of the best examples is digestion. Now, digestion is already a long process, it takes about 12 hours for the average person to consume something and then have it leave the body again. That process would actually take days and we would ultimately starve to death because we would not be able to get enough calories in because that process would be so slow in getting the return of the energy in that food back to our body to be able to use. 
So enzymes are going to just make those chemical reactions happen at a faster rate than they would on their own. The next slide that you have takes a look at a metabolic pathway. And what this ultimately is, is really looking at how we can control how things take place in the body. So this is going to be a situation where you have a series of substrates that will bind to their enzyme, but that first thing has to happen in order for the next one to happen, and so on and so forth. So very much like a chain reaction or assembly line. Part one has to happen before part two, part three, and on down the line before you get your desired effect or product. And the reason for that is, again, just so your body can regulate that things just don't happen whenever and however, but that they only take place when we really need it to. So a lot of times metabolic pathways are just used as a control method in really monitoring what the body is doing and making sure that it's not doing something that it shouldn't be. Sometimes it fails, but for the most part, this is a very good checks and balance system that our body uses. One trick that you can use to identify enzymes is the last three letters or the suffix that you have on the term. So typically an enzyme, and it's not 100%, but typically an enzyme will end in the A-S-E suffix. If it ends in O-S-E, that indicates a sugar. But when you see that A-S-E as the final three, now we're looking to an enzyme. And you know that this is something the body is using to speed up a particular process. The next slide that you have takes a look at energy. And when we look at energy, we've already talked about this a couple of times. Number one, in order to make bonds and hold them together, there's going to need to be an energy input. It takes energy to hold molecules or elements together. If you break those bonds, now that energy is going to be released and it can be released in a variety of ways depending on the elements that you are dealing with. So it can be heat, light, you could have smoke, all sorts of different things that could be given off as this exchange or release of energy happens. If you've ever seen fireworks go off, you have seen the release of energy. So we light them. When it goes off, you see these bonds breaking, and we know that there's heat. We know that there's light. We know that there's sound. You get all of these changes that are happening because bonds are being broken within that firework. And if you want to change the color that you see, you simply change the elements that are in that particular firework. The last part of the slide talks about oxidation and cellular respiration. And I'm actually going to go into the next slide, uh, which is titled cellular respiration. When we talk about cellular respiration, if we just knock that down to respiration, people would say they think of breathing, inhaling, exhaling, which is very true. But if we add that term cellular on there, now it's not us breathing air in and out, but now it's our cells. And they're not breathing in and out like we typically would, but they are using oxygen. And so when we talk about inhaling and taking oxygen into our body, people just associate that with going down to our lungs and kind of forget about it at that point. But that oxygen that we're inhaling does not stop in the lungs. It has a very real purpose which is the entire process of cellular respiration. So we break cellular respiration down into three parts. First part is known as glycolysis. Second part is known as the citric acid cycle. And some of you might have actually heard it as the Krebs cycle, and that's fine. You can use those two interchangeably. And then you have the electron transport chain, often abbreviated as ETC. If you like ETC and that makes sense to you, use it. Otherwise, you can use the whole term. So this is a three-part process of what the body has to do to take that oxygen and actually maximize the benefit of that particular element being in our system. So the first one with glycolysis, what's actually happening is we are trying to build ATP molecules. So if you go down to the next slide, it's called ATP molecules. This is a high energy molecule that we use in the human body. This is our fuel source. If you want your car to run, you put in gas. If you want your body to run, you build ATP. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine is really a base for everything to kind of hold on to. The tri indicates three and phosphate is indicating a phosphate atom that is attached and there are three of them. Now, if you've ever seen phosphate and what it looks like, 
it has a lot of oxygen and phosphorus involved, a ton of bonds. So what that means is there's a lot of energy available, and that's really what makes it a high energy molecule is all those bonds that are involved with those phosphates. So we build these ATP molecules, and then when we need an energy source in our body, we simply snap off that last phosphate. Now, once we take off that N-phosphate, there's no longer three of them. We now have just two, and so it becomes known